Good evening. Uh, we're going to talk about the topical subject of pandemics in the past and now, with emphasis on institutional responses in the past in workhouses, prisons and hospitals, and now in nursing homes, direct, direct provision centres and hospitals. We've got a terrific panel to discuss these issues and the broader history of pandemics and virology, with particular focus on the so-called Spanish flu of 100 years ago, the last global pandemic with considerable effects on society. Our panelists are Luke O'Neill, Professor of Biochemistry at Trinity College Dublin, Dr. Ida Milne, whose book Stacking the Coffins is the definitive account of the Spanish flu in Ireland, Dr. Killian de Gascoon, Director of the National Virus Reference Laboratory and Chair of the Expert Advisory Group to the National Public Health Emergency Team, and Fintan O'Toole, Ireland's best known journalist, columnist in the Irish Times, author of many books, and commentator on the current handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to say a few words about the Grange Gorman Histories Project. In the past 250 years, Grange Gorman on the north side of Dublin has been the site of a prison, a workhouse, and a very well-known mental hospital. Thousands of Dubliners and others pass through these institutions very unwillingly, usually. Now it is being fully in integrated into the city as a health and education campus. Grange Gorman Histories is a public history project of Dublin City Council, the Grange Gorman Development Agency, the HSE, local communities, the National Archives, the Royal Irish Academy and the new Technological University of Dublin, which has taken over that site to very interesting and transformative effect. The Grange Gorman Development Agency and the Royal Irish Academy will lead a programme of research and shared discovery into the social history of imprisonment, transportation, early public welfare and the treatment of mental illness since the mid 19th century. The planned programme of events, exhibitions, publications and learning opportunities will help to uncover the history of the site and its surrounding communities. There will be a professionally structured oral history project to capture the memories of local residents, many of whom worked in the mental hospital. The Grange Gorman Histories Expert Working Group, chaired by Dr. Philip Cohen, has been appointed to, re to realise this programme. All of the information relating to the project is detailed in our foundation document, which you can download from the website at www.grangegormanhistories.ie. We already know that Grange Gorman had direct experience of a series of epidemics since the 1800s. The Richmond Penitentiary site was considered instrumental in the containment of some of the infections that blighted the 19th century, particularly the cholera epidemic that swept across Europe in the 1830s. Even before the penitentiary accepted its first prisoners, it was employed as a fever hospital during a typhus fever outbreak in 1818. In 1832, the big year of the cholera epidemic, the Richmond Penitentiary served as a temporary cholera hospital when this epidemic claimed the lives of 4,478 Dubliners alone between March and December of that year. The disease was highly contagious and deadly, killing victims within 12 hours of infection. In 1832, the Cholera Board published a proclamation appealing to people to remove the sick to hospital, to ventilate rooms, to scrape floors, and to wash and disinfect surfaces with lime while burning and replacing straw bedding. Only recovered patients were to self-isolate, quote, not to visit in a family or go to a place of worship or to any crowded assembly, end quote. Now that sounds very, very familiar to us today, and that was 1832. This treatable disease struck most devastatingly in poor, overcrowded housing without a clean water supply. We know that the garden of the penitentiary became a cholera cemetery. In 2015, tre trenches were unearthed by construction workers near the Broadstone Lewis, and remains of thousands of individuals were excavated from charnel pits. A single headstone was found on the plot, that of Anthony Dunleavy, who died on the 28th of July, 1832, during the peak of the epidemic. Further outbreaks of typhoid, cholera and beriberi spread in the institution and in 1897 the penitentiary was again taken over as an isolation hospital to contain the outbreak. So there are multiple histories to be explored in this significant area of northwest Dublin city, now with the capacity to focus on the individuals who were incarcerated and treated there and those who worked in the various institutions which provided employment to generations of people who lived in the surrounding areas. Another important aspect of the project is a partnership with the HSE to properly open up historical mental records for research by scholars and for family history. We're hoping that protocols can be created to release records, not just from Grange Gorman, but all other surviving archives of mental health institutions in this country. 
This will greatly enhance our knowledge of medical and psychiatric treatment, social history, and the pivotal place of these huge institutions in their catchment areas. We're very hopeful that this can happen before too long. And I can tell you that there is a, a huge treasure trove of records relating to mental hospitals all over the country, some at the moment in quite severe danger that need to be rescued from the, the, the hospitals where they still are, some in better conditions, but between them all, they comprise in, in a sort of a way, a shadow social history of 19th and 20th century Ireland. And we're very excited about finally being able to open these up for research. So now to our patient and wonderful panel. I'd like each of you to give us five minutes or so on particular aspects of past and present pandemics. So Luke, I'm going to start with you. And if you remember over a socially distanced drink in Galway, not too long ago, you revealed to me that you had a lot of information about pandemics uh, and present pandemics, pandemics in the past and ones that, the one that we're having now. So um, I would like you to see if you can take us as you did me that night in the Radisson Hotel through them. Um, and if you want to congregate on the effect they might have had on congregated settings, please do so. Luke. Yeah, Katrina, but it's very interesting you mentioned cholera there, remember? I mean, as we all know, there were lots of pandemics all through human history. As soon as humans evolved, almost, we begin to see infections begin to spread. And the main reason is we begin to gather in crowds in, in accommodation. Agriculture was a big factor here, for instance. We pick up infections off animals. They give us infections and vice versa. TB is a great example. We probably infected animals with that instead of infecting us, for instance. You know, So there's a long history of infectious diseases afflicting humanity. And the history of, of humanity really is about the immune system because um, the immune system had to con con uh, deal with these infectious agents. And it was very often an arms race then because a pathogen would evolve a weapon to beat the host to survive, and the host then would make a new weapon to counter the pathogen. And much of what we do actually is called host-pathogen interactions. So, so it's a fascination to think that uh, humans get afflicted with these pathogens over the millennia. And again, the reason does seem to be things like overcrowding, uh, domestication of animals are the two big factors we think. In other words, if we look at uh, humans in as, as um, noble savages, should we use that term, uh, nomadic, you know, sparse populations. There wasn't much, much infection in those times. So in many ways, it's almost as if the invention of things like agriculture and cities and towns propagates pandemics through history. And then if we look at the human body now, we are sculpted from that battle. And let me give you one quick example, HIV. So HIV AIDS, as we all know, devastating in the 80s. We all remember, those of us who are old enough, the devastating ads of of, of, of headstones collapsing and so on. Uh, science delivers on that one. We don't develop a vaccine, of course. It's very difficult to get a vaccine for HIV for various reasons, but we make antivirals that kill the virus and they're successful. I mean, HIV is now, now uh, no longer a life-threatening disease. I think last year they showed if you HIV, you would expect to live a, a, as long a life as if you hadn't. But remember, a fraction of the population are naturally resistant to that virus. There's a thing called CCR5. There's a variant in that in your immune system. If you have that variant, you never get HIV. Now, if there'd been no treatment for HIV, and if that virus had let run loose through the Earth's population, a lot of the Earth would have become, you know, would have died out. The ones who survive have the, ha happen to have, through dumb luck, by the way, the right variants in the immune genes to defend them. And that's the case for all infectious diseases. Our bodies are, are, are descended from people who naturally resisted infection. So it's a fascinating business, this idea of built-in resistance and how we resist infection. The last thing I would say is, um, Katrina, your cholera story is very interesting. I mean, cholera was a devastating disease. It, it came and went. Herd immunity was never achieved with cholera naturally. Remember, that's a very important point. We keep banging on about herd immunity. That never happened for any natural infection. You would see an immunity build up in the population, of course, and the virus would go away for a while, but it would always reinfect. It would come from somewhere else. A different tribe would have it, say. Or babies are born with naive immune systems, and they would pick up the virus, and now it propagates. How do we beat, beat cholera? Antibiotics, first and foremost, Alexander Fleming begins with him and he discovers penicillin. And then the vaccine is discovered for cholera as well. Now, we still see cholera, of course, in certain parts of the world. It's still a dangerous disease in the developing world. It's eliminated from rich countries because we have vaccines and antibiotics to treat it. But there, there's an example. We'll never see cholera in Dublin again. 
unlike back in those days that you just spoke of in the in Grange Gorham, and that won't happen again because science came along to beat it. And of course, to finish, our, our hope is with COVID, uh, we will see a vaccine or an antiviral, you never know, will come along to beat this particular virus. So there's a few opening uh, thoughts for you. Thank you so much, Luke. That was a, a wonderful trip through the battleground of infection and what it does to us and how we're, we're sometimes able to resist it, but how we have to rely in the end on science to, to save us from the, the overwhelming effects of these things. Ida, I'm going to move to you next. Uh, your book, Stacking the Coffin, says it all in the title in many ways, that it was impossible for the authorities to keep up with the, the, the speed of death in Dublin at, at the time when that happened 100 years ago. It's a really vivid account of, of what happened during the Spanish flu. Um, and you've unearthed all the relevant uh, statistics and numbers. So you're going to talk to us today, and thank you for this, about a few of the institutions uh, uh, that that were about at the time and how they dealt with the, uh, the Spanish flu, Ida. Yes, as you've pointed out, institutional records uh, can be really revelatory about um, what happens during epidemics and pandemics. And uh, in one way, they can show the extent of the crisis because they can be completely silent on it uh, because people just didn't have time to, to keep the records. And then other institutions can really um, show a great deal, as you say, mirroring the rest of society on it. Uh, one group of records, which I found absolutely fabulous um, for studying the 1918 flu was the General Prison Board's record which have a voluminous correspondence about it. And uh, they showed the parallel tensions between the pandemic and the political situation, which again um, is heightened by the fact that so many of um, the nationalists are in prison, whether um, in uh, through the Defence of the Realm Act uh, prisoners in Ireland, say for example in Crumlin Road Jail, they, they um, create um, a lot of tension through the newspapers to try and um, get better care for those members of their members who are sick with the flu. And then again, because of the German plot, because um, several of the nationalist and conscription, uh, anti conscription ca campaigners are uh, interned in, in uh, the UK at the time. So um, a lot of the, a lot of this um, tension feeds back into the domestic prisons as well. Uh, when two um, members of the German plot group, uh, Pierce McCann and uh, Richard Coleman, die in English jails, um, they are um, the the Irish prisons become very sensitive to the idea uh, that political prisoners could die in Ireland. So they're constantly talking. Uh, about you know the need to keep a calm in the jails, but indeed only one prisoner uh, dies in an Irish jail from influenza during the period, and that's a female uh, prisoner um, in Derry at the time. In terms of the mental institutions, uh, there is um, or the 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 the. the, the uh, asylums for the insane, as they were called at the time, um, they um, see about um, 400 extra deaths in 1918 and about 200 extra deaths in 1919. Uh, they have a massive issue when the staffs keep going sick. Uh, for example, in Sligo Leitrim um, in August um, 19. Um, 18, uh, the um, maintenance staff have to come in nurse because so many of the regular um, psychiatric staff are ill um, that, that the maintenance staff are called in to take over from them. And in one of the, the asylums, there was a breakout. The other area I think is absolutely fascinating is the uh, workhouses. Uh, there are 3,329 extra deaths in the workhouses right throughout the country in 1918. Uh, and two and a half, uh, 2,500 of those are certified to influenza and pneumonia. Uh, about 500 others are certified to heart disease. So it shows again um, how um, it's not just about deaths directly from the disease that's calling, causing the pandemic, but um, associated deaths, you know, that, 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 that can exacerbate other illnesses as, as well. Um, the uh, workhouses, um, infirmaries very quickly become overrun uh, during the pandemic and they would often have to take over rooms in other parts of the workhouse as well as in infirmaries themselves. Uh, the deaths drop back quite swiftly uh, by about 3,000 the next
next year. So it wasn't as much a problem at all in, in 19, um, from April 1919 as it was in the year to April 1919, which was the main year of the pandemic. OK, thanks, Saida. Uh, I think the Spanish flu killed about 21,000 people in Ireland uh, in those years. You can correct me if I'm wrong about that. Um, but it gives us an idea, a lot of what we heard there, particularly about the mental hospitals, um, strikes a familiar note in terms of what happened here in nursing homes and luckily not in direct provision centres. But um, it, is, it is something to bear in mind when we look at the whole business of institutional care. Killian, you next. Um, the history of virology is, is a story of fascinating discoveries, many of which led to life-saving treatments and vaccines. Will you tell us a little about the history of virology and some of these discoveries? Yes, thanks, Christina. I suppose we're talking about um, Spanish influenza, and I think that's really defined probably the last century of, of virology in, in many respects, um, purely because it was the it was the the pandemic in 1918 that, that led to a significant amount of of interest and in, in trying to ascertain the cause of of the illness because prior to that outbreak um people will i suppose people in infection at least will be familiar with haemophilus influenza which is a bacterium um, that was discovered by pfeiffer and he believed the reason he called it haemophilus influenza was because he believed it was the actual cause of of influenza itself, which, which of course it wasn't. The, the name influenza I suppose, predates what we now call the virus. And the Spanish flu, I suppose, was so important over the last century is because it, after the initial um, massive impact it had on society globally um, and on the population, it became our, our seasonal influenza and really stayed with us um, for the last hundred years. Again, people of a certain age will remember the 1957 Asian flu and the 1968 Hong Kong flu. And even though at the time, from a virology perspective, we were looking at, at antibodies to, to characterize those viruses, and we knew that they were different from the, the H1N1 in 1918, we know now from molecular work that has been done in the last 20 years, that in actual fact, that 1918 virus provided the backbone to the 1957 influenza virus, which was labeled H2N2 at the time, and then the 1968 virus, H3N2. So from an antibody or serology perspective, we thought they were different viruses, but we know now that Spanish flu is actually um, providing the backbone to, to all of those viruses and really stayed with us up until 2009 when we had a, a new pandemic and different or novel H1N1 virus that, that supplanted or replaced our existing seasonal influenza. And in actual fact, we know even from looking at the 2009 virus, that part of the reason that it probably was milder than we would have anticipated from a, a pandemic perspective was because again, although it was a a new constellation of gene segments. So influenza viruses have segmented genomes, which means that they can reassort and recombine quite a lot. Um, we know now that the 2009 virus really, although it was a, a novel uh, reassortment or a novel collection of gene segments, uh, it wasn't really completely novel in the sense that it was uh, coming from um, a, an avian reservoir or crossing the species barrier, as we've seen with, with coronavirus, coronavirus type two. And I think if we look at the last century of influenza viruses, if we're trying to take some information from that or some knowledge from that, that might give us some guide as to what SARS-CoV-2 will do. And generally speaking, when viruses come into the population, they tend not to disappear unless they're replaced by, by something else or, or unless we get to a level of, of significant population level immunity. But we know, again, using, if we look at the, human coronaviruses that we have to date, the, the ones that cause the common cold and, and typically undergo a sort of, or see a, a peak in, in activity every year. We have four, we have OC43, 229E, HKU1 and NL63. So two of those were discovered in the 1960s and two of those were discovered in the, in the noughties. So we really probably don't envisage um, SARS-CoV-2 going anywhere anytime soon purely because it's found a susceptible host, it's managed to establish itself in, in the population um, quite readily. Um, and while it might 
over the course of, of years or decades become become milder. Um, we don't know when our existing human coronaviruses crossed the species barrier, but it's likely that when they did, they probably caused more severe disease than they do now. Um, as with any pathogen going into a new host, um, typically it can be a little bit rambunctious when it first first gets there. Um, but even if we, again, take a, take a lead for influenza, we have a very good vaccine against influenza. It's not perfect that we receive uh, on a yearly basis. Um, but even with the, with a very good vaccine and with the, we probably haven't had the level of uptake that we need um, to try and uh, eradicate influenza. But generally speaking, from an infection perspective, if we look at viruses that have an animal reservoir, then eradication really is never is never an option for us. So thankfully, with with polio, we've been able to uh, we're very, getting very close to eliminating that globally. Smallpox, we were able to eliminate, but really, it's a it's a challenge to eliminate anything with an immunization policy alone. We're we're getting close with measles and rubella as well, and again, that's because they don't have a an animal reservoir, and humans are the natural host. But certainly, I think if we look at what we can learn from influenza, despite the fact that it's a, it's a different virus, I think what it tells us about SARS-CoV-2 is that it's likely to, to stay with us for, for quite a while, even if we do manage to get a vaccine in the next six to 12 months. Okay, thank you, Killian. They're pesky little buggers, these viruses, aren't they? And there appear to be thousands of them, uh, many of which never come to full fruition and exploit us as hosts in the way that we fear they might. But it's grim, I suppose, to, to, to look to the future and see such a long period of time without any, any relief. Uh, we hope that that may ultimately not be the case. Fintan, you've been writing about uh, some of the aspects of, of our current handling of COVID-19 since, since it all began. Do you want to tell us how we've done here and maybe talk a little bit, bit about elsewhere, our next door neighbours across the water. And if you want to talk a little bit, if, if it suits you to, about nursing homes, direct provision centres, the whole institutional uh, burden, if you like, of, of what's happened with the virus here. So I'm, I'm very conscious of being the person with the least uh, expertise on this distinguished panel. Um, so I'll, I'll probably um, wander off into sweeping generalisations, which is what I tend to do. But um, Pandemics or, or plagues, as I suppose they were called for most of human history, uh, are themselves almost like investigative journalists. You know, they they find out the things which have been hidden. Uh, it's very striking that if we go back two and a half thousand years to one of the great foundation stones of Western art, um, Sophocles' play uh, *Oedipus the King*. Uh, what's happening in that play? Well, you know. There's a plague and, and the plague forces the city to find out what's wrong. There's something hidden, which of course is that Oedipus has killed his father and married his mother. Um, but it's the plague that sort of is the pressure point that, that, that um, reveals the truth. Um, and what, uh, I suppose what, what pandemics uh, tend to reveal is what I've called in other contexts, um, stealing from and adapting Donald Rumsfeld, uh, the, the unknown knowns, the things we know about but, but don't want to know about, really, that we've kind of put out of our minds. And I think there, in, in this episode of our own history, just two things have really struck me. I mean, one is a general complacency, and this is, this is absolutely not true, of course, of, of my fellow panelists who are, who are you know, working in these areas for so long and so many, and, and Ida as, as, a, as a historian, but I would say in general in the society, and maybe this is true of most Western societies, um, we've become extraordinarily complacent about the idea of contagion, of airborne diseases. Um, I'm old enough, as I think possibly you might be, Katrina, to remember you know, j just how conscious we were as kids of polio, of tuberculosis, you know, the the, the X-ray van outside the, the, the Bank of Ireland, you know, in, in Dublin, I'm sure in, in similar things in most Irish cities, the kids with calipers in, in, in the class beside you because of the polio epidemic. Um, 
you, you know, signs on the buses saying, do not expectorate. Um, I learned the word expectorate when I was three or four from being on the bus, you know, because people spitting, people coughing, people sneezing was bad. And, and a huge amount of that had just been sort of forgotten, I think, because we've been fortunate to be in this bubble when we haven't had a huge threat from a specific um, uh, plague other than other than AIDS, you know, which was, of course, very much framed as being about specific groups of people, probably wrongly, but I think that's, that's very much the way it was thought about in society. Uh, and we've suddenly had to know this, this, um, this, this unknown again. Um, and so there is a shock, uh, which, which I think hits the general population in relation to this, which might not have been the case at most previous times of history. Most people would have expected bad news um, coming in the form of airborne infection. Uh, the, the other um, uh, unknown known, of course, is institutions. And it, it, it's very striking to me anyway that um, the, 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 the things we've, we've known particularly about residential institutions for a long time is that they're not great places for people to be. And this is not a criticism of, you know, there are some fantastically run nursing homes or some fantastically run residential institutions. Um, but, you know, th these are not places that people resort to voluntarily. <laughs> we, we, we've known for a long time that all studies of older people say, do, do you want to end your life in, in residential care? You know, the vast majority of people say, no, I want to be at home. Um, you know, so so we, we we've sort of known this, and 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 we've known that there are alternatives, and that there are alternatives that we should have been exploring and 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 developing of care in the community. I think everybody accepts some people have to be in residential institutions, but there are probably very large numbers of people, uh, both older people and people with disabilities, who don't want to be in these institutions and probably shouldn't be if we if we had, as a society, reorganised ourselves so that they could be um, kept within the community. And of course, direct provision is a is a is a very very striking example of that. Uh, to you know, it's probably the worst. Um, direct provision is in some ways our contemporary equivalent of the institutional incarceration, the, the institutional incarceration, of which we are so rightly ashamed historically. Um, but we we've been doing this to people, including to children, uh, for a very long time, and we've known again that that it's not a good thing to do to people. And what the pandemic does is then it it it, it comes along and it 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 sheds a light um, on these institutions and on the the danger uh, that's that's there. And it brings to mind just that um, horrible old cliche, you know, out, out of sight, out of mind. Um, if if you're not seen, if you're not understood to be part of the community, um, then when something like this happens, you are in danger. The, the 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 solidarity, the 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 mutual support, the mutual awareness that kicks in um, when, as a society, we try to deal with these things, uh, just isn't there for people who have been physically segregated out. Uh, and and I think this is one of the things that we saw in the Irish case. Um, I've always been very reluctant to criticise people who are who are trying to deal with the pandemic because it's a it's a horrible business. Um, it's horrible psychologically. I'm sure it's really terrible in terms of people's workload and all the rest of it. But there is no question but that we we left nursing homes and residential institutions um, out of mind to a very large extent in the early stages of the pandemic, and 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 that's where most of the death was. I mean, that's that's really where the fatalities um, happened. Um, and I don't blame the people who were who were specifically trying to deal with the problem as a whole in this in this really um, incredibly difficult context. I, I think the real blame for that lies on a much wider level as to, to how we've allowed these areas of our society to, to be marginalized, to be segregated, not just in terms of the residents, but remember also in terms of the people who work in them. So very large numbers of people working in these institutions who are on minimum wage, um, who are who are working for agencies who don't themselves have sick pay. Remember, you know, we've got a lot of carers who, who are not entitled to sick pay. Th th these are structural things that we we have allowed to happen. So, um, where does this leave us? Uh, um, I think uh, perhaps what it tells us, and if we we look at uh, 
the British on the one side of us and the Americans on the other side of us. We, we feel a certain gratitude. Um, you know, uh, uh, Heinrich Böll, the German novelist, always said that the uh, the, the classic um, Irish, the, the characteristic Irish statement was, it could be worse. <laughs> and um, it could be worse. It, it, you know, we, we have been relatively fortunate in the quality of our political leadership. Um, uh, however, it also could be better. You know, we, 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 we don't have room for complacency about this. And in particular, I think because we've moved out of the, the immediate emergency phase of this into the sense that this is a long-term challenge, I, I think there's a, there's a critical need to broaden the political discourse about it. You know, it's, 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 it's a medical challenge but it's a medical challenge that highlights social challenges. It, it really highlights very, very obvious things that we needed to be doing. And if I am critical, it's it's on that level of, you know, the broader all of government's approach that we're supposed to have to these things, I would argue has been often very badly missing. And I'll just finish with two very simple examples of that. Um, one is dealing with sick pay. Again, something, you know, Ireland's one of the very few European societies that, that 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 doesn't have mandatory sick pay. Um, yes, the state has, has stepped in and, and tried to fill that gap, but there's still huge numbers of people who are in very, very um, uncertain conditions around all of that, and that definitely affects their behaviour. Th that could have been fixed and should have been fixed. Um, a, a, a second obvious thing, just, to just a very small point of detail, but it, I think it just shows what I'm trying to get at. If you think about going back, schools going back, for example, um, a critical thing for the society right, to get the schools back. I, I completely agree with that. Why were we not planning in in April, you know, in May, for how do you do that spatially, right? Well, one of the things you might want to do spatially is is um, is get prefabs in, for example. Um, you can't build a prefab in a school without planning permission. You can't get planning permission for you know six months if you're really lucky, probably longer. It, it, there's n nobody saying when schools are, are going to go back should we have a, a a change to the law that says in this immediate emergency context um if you're a school you can bloody well build a prefab if you want you know so th there's a whole layer of social and political decision making uh, that i think is necessary beyond the medical um and i think as time has gone on those things have become more and more critical to us Thanks, Fintan. Uh, and when we come to the end of the second round, you're going to have time to, to talk to us a little about what outcomes you think there might be ideally from the so-called learnings that we've all got from uh, the pandemic, precisely the kinds of things you were talking about, changes in infrastructure, in systems, and in the philosophy, I suppose, of government and society that might, if we're lucky, result from from what we've all gone through with this. Um, Ida, I'm going to start with you on this second round, and I've, I've two things to ask you. One is, could you talk to us about the similarities and dissimilarities between the 1918-20 pandemic and now, in terms of infection control, public health measures, treatment, if any, I don't think there was ever a vaccination at that stage anyway, against the flu. Uh, and you know how like or unlike are they to what we're doing now? And one of the most interesting chapters of your book, this is the second question, is the global amnesia that that settled in after the end of the Spanish flu, where it wasn't written about or talked about for a very, very long time. Now we know it coincided with the end of World War I, where there was a devastating amount of death to deal with. This was extra death on top of that already devastating burden. So it's possible that was the reason. But I, it was fascinating to me when I read your book that it was epidemiologists, not historians, who started to investigate the, the Spanish flu of 1918 to 20, uh, much, much later in the, the 20th century. Could you talk to both of those points? Certainly. Um, I'm fascinated that both you and Finton have uh, raised the idea of um, uh, pandemics, epidemics, uh, casting a light on society. And uh, Paul Slack, the historian, talks about this, that they show up the major flaws in society and what's wrong with them. Um, but that's just a quick reflection. Um, uh, in terms of 
what happened, what kind of treatments were used, that kind of thing. It's probably very much a picture here of what it would have been like without lockdown. Um, it's really swept around the country here in Ireland uh, quite quickly in three waves. Um, in uh, May, June 1918, in the autumn, winter of 1918, and then again in the spring of 1919. Um, the doctors very much like today a mirror a image they scrabbled around scientists and doctors scrabbled around to try and find treatments uh, they couldn't come up with any one solution so they seemed to throw everything in their doctor's bag at it and the royal academy of medicine had a big meeting on, on the 15th of november 1918 to try and get everybody from the different major dublin hospitals in particular to pool ideas so there were uh, curiously using treatments that are quite similar to some of today's treatments, quinine, for example, a, a, an anti-malarial remedy, which was then a very common um, anti-fever remedy, uh, was one of the main remedies they used. They also used calomel, which is mercurous chloride. And I think doctors use that as a kind of a smoke and mirrors thing that, that, that it had the immediate effect of making the patient want to get out of bed to go to the loo. So if you had to sit in the pet pot uh, when you had previously felt you couldn't budge because the flu was so bad, Perhaps that is something of a confidence inducing measure. Um, whiskey and brandy were given out in copious amounts by um, uh, the older doctors in particular from some of the accounts. Uh, but whiskey and brandy would have been a, a, a part, a normal part of um, hospitals and um, uh, the workhouse um, um, store cupboards anyway. They gave it out quite frequently to help people sleep. And I suppose also in flu, it would help to ease, um, you know, make you a bit sleepy and may, uh, also ease the, if you were given it in hot whiskey, ease the kind of respiratory aspects. It spreads in a very similar way, of course, because it's an influenza and it spreads through um, respiratory droplets in, in, in very, very similar way. So when I saw this first coming from Wuhan and spreading ever closer and you're watching it, I, a lot of my work was through the newspapers. Um, it's, it seemed to spread in a very, very similar way. And I suppose that had my antenna up very quickly uh, in early January uh, about it. And I think uh, my students at Carlo College and my fellow staff probably thought I'd quite lost the plot, plot because I was so convinced this was going to be something really big at the time. Um, but it was such a close echo in so many ways. And um, the whole idea of medical puzzle, um, I suppose, is very similar to. Um, uh, in terms of the amnesia, um, I know Finton, Finton has written in the past about his own family and um, the impact of disease on that. Um, one of the reasons I think it was forgotten is um, that disease made uh, was such a big part of normal life in Ireland and even in other uh, countries, uh, you know, relatively well developed countries like Ireland at the time. 20% um, of the annual deaths on, on the island in the, any year in the 1910s, it was usually about 70,000 deaths a year, but 20% of those would be children under the age of five and they would be, uh, many of them were from disease, but also from, from uh, conditions of poverty. So you would have um, deaths from things like uh, measles, bronchitis, pneumonias in the thousands, TB, of course, uh, but also things like whooping cough, um, scarlet fever, uh, killed in the pre-antibiotic era. Again, it's fascinating, as you say, that it's epidemiologists that first start to count it in the 1920s and then afterwards. And history takes a lot longer to actually see it as being something valid for study. And I think this is partly because um, social history isn't, doesn't really become popular. The idea of the history of the individual and of their health uh, is not all that popular until after the Second World War and then it snowballs. Alfred Crosby, the wonderful American environmental uh, historian, um, whose other great work was on the Columbian Exchange on how um, biotas transferred forwards and backwards with the discovery of the Americas between Europe and, and the Americas. Um, all sorts of things like VD are transferred across and also um, fevers and influenzas and things are transferred backwards and forwards uh, across the Atlantic at that stage. Uh, but his second big work was on um, the uh, another great environmental thing, the, the, the Spanish flu. And um, 
he really started the ball rolling with such a fascinating and readable study. You know, he gives great details about Woodrow Wilson catching it at the Paris Peace Conference and how that affects his ability to negotiate. And, um, um, you know, he, his story, I think, then started uh, Howard Phillips in um, South Africa, uh, Jeff Rice in New Zealand, uh, Niall Johnson then in, in the UK. And now we have a, a terrific network of um, uh, international researchers from many different disciplines um, on the 1918 flu. And we're all the time trying to uh, get learnings from that um, and show um, how it can be applied in uh, future uh, pandemics and um, we didn't expect one to come quite so quickly I suppose uh, when we were um, particularly looking at, at the centenary in 2018-2019 and then just a few short months later this thing happens. Thanks for that, uh, Ida. It is, you know, it's amazing how things can be forgotten and of course you're right Social history doesn't come into its own until, I suppose, at the earliest, the 1950s. It's why it's so important that we now get access to, to the records and archives that we need to be able to explore Irish social history in more detail than we have. Luke, coming on to you again, um, since issues like testing and treatment and vaccination affect residents and institutions as much, if not more, than the rest of us, uh, what's your opinion of where we are now with those developments? Well, it's a work in progress, Katrina, to some extent, is the truth of the matter. You know, I mean, clearly we know now there are four fronts in this battle. To beat this virus, we have to occupy all four fronts. The first is what I might call the medieval front, and Ida would agree, I'm sure. The stuff we're doing in terms of distancing and public health wouldn't have been any different 100 years ago, maybe a little bit, but certainly... I got a great thing either recently about there was a, a fact sheet about the night of the Spanish flu with the same instructions almost as we're using now. Wear a mask was even on that, you know, and social distancing. You can't tell the difference. So, so you know, you much science. So the first front is like it was through hundreds of years. And it is things like quarantine, distancing, hygiene. That was there through many pandemics. The second front is, of course, the vaccine. That's the one we're all talking about. Great progress there. There's cautious optimism using Tony Fauci's well-worn phrase it gets more optimistic as time goes by to be honest I mean last week Johnson & Johnson announced a huge um, phase three trial 60,000 people will be on this trial it involves nine countries their vaccine candidate is the same technology they got in the Ebola vaccine which has efficacy and they've popped in the spike protein now into that so and, and it's also it doesn't need to be frozen or kept cold that's a great advance if we're going to get into the developing world quickly one shot so that johnson vaccine to me looks like a really exciting one we now have five vaccines in phase three uh, i'd say reasonably we'll get readouts initial results for them if we're lucky towards the end of the year q1 next year we'll know if these have any hope in them really you know and that's tremendous the third front we're fighting is, of course, therapeutics, my own area. Anti-inflammatories, ways to handle patients in hospitals, keep them alive. Uh, we're seeing progress there. Dexamethasone is a steroid which showed a reasonable effect. It, it was a 20% effect, but that means that instead of five people dying, four are. That's an advance. We're going to see more therapeutics. I mean, my big optimism, many of us have an optimism around antibody therapies, and there's at least 40 different antibodies in trials at the moment. One that looks especially exciting is uh, the drug company Lilly as a prophylactic. So they're giving that antibody now to people in care homes in the US and they're trying to see if it will protect them from getting infected. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we can protect the vulnerable now with a therapeutic as a prophylactic? That's going to be a big advance. And again, these are safer, or not, not, not so much safer, they're, they're, they're well-worn antibodies. They're kind of used a lot in other diseases. So there's less concerns about safety. Our number one thing to look at with the vaccine is of course safety and, and that's 60,000 patient trial it's got 60,000 people because they want to make sure there's a strong safety signal here that, that it isn't going to cause any harm and that must be uppermost in our minds and then we get to the testing the fourth front in this battle is test trace isolate the dream there would be constant testing anytime any place anywhere uh, it could be in care homes it could be in airports it could be in schools it could be in the hallway of your house why wouldn't each house in, in the country have a test? And you test yourself before you go outdoors, maybe two or three times a week. That's the dream. Now, that's a very tough dream to um, to realize. Clearly, we have the PCR testing, as 
as Killian well knows in spades. I mean, that's a very sophisticated test. It, it takes a bit of effort and time and expertise. Um, the next will be the antigen test, which measures protein in the virus. That's a very rapid 15 minute test. So you've never seen such effort. Every major pharma company, remember, has a massive diagnostic division because when you go to hospital and get tested for anything, that's made by a big company that's well used to doing testing, you see. So every big company now is deploying their best and brightest at devising a very sophisticated, high accuracy test. One example I'm giving is, is an Israeli company who are trying to make a mask that shows if you're positive from your breath. Can you imagine if a mask gives an indication that you're infectious? What a tremendous advance that would be because that means stay home, isolate. We can beat this virus through selective isolation of infected people remember and that's done properly at a high enough level doesn't have to be perfect it could be 60 70 80 percent um efficacy in the testing would would do remember 60 70 percent efficacy in the vaccine will do as well because then the virus begins to peter out all of this is about getting the reddit, reddit or number below one remember that can be achieved through social distancing it can be achieved through a vaccine that's the main thing a vaccine does by the way it gets the or not down to point one that's tremendous because then it stops spreading you know so all of these things are happening in real time katrina and and as the months go by we will see more and more little examples of success on all four fronts i predict we'll see little indicators that the virus is now being brought to heal the ultimate answer is a vaccine no doubt about that at all uh, it gets rolled out as we all know in the vulnerable groups first and in the um, the healthcare workers that'll take about three or four months they reckon to see that begin to see an effect and now we're into june july august of next year if we're lucky now remember there's unknowns here the thing can fall over vaccines have failed in the past even worse certain vaccines make disease worse and let's hope that isn't the case with these vaccines and but we still don't fully know you see but certainly at the moment you'd be looking at june july august september next year when the vaccine begins to get rolled out we need more than one vaccine you won't vaccinate the world with a single vaccine if four or five are efficacious now we can begin to imagine a future where the entire world is going to get vaccinated and then of course guess what let's not that's something that kind of finton touched on almost there i mean this virus has shone a light on how badly we're handling malaria already and cholera there's a big outbreak of cholera happening at the moment you know in terms of diseases we can already treat we're seeing outbreaks of those for various reasons so so, that, so, so what we need is a, a, beyond this pandemic a much more effective way to deal with infectious diseases more globally surely will be one of the outcomes from this pandemic that we're in the middle of now. So that gives you a quick little vista of the coming months ahead of us. Thanks, Luke. I have a supplementary question which may occur to some of our viewers. Um, the vaccines seem to be all being done by major pharmaceutical companies, some of them in partnership with academic institutions like the Oxford trial. Is there going to be a cat fight for profit about the vaccine when it finally, when one or more of them proves to be safe and effective? Uh, and are we going to end up with vast amounts of money being made by pharmaceutical companies? Or will there be some sort of international protocol to make sure that the vaccine gets to everybody, particularly the developing world, who won't, won't be able to afford it unless it is made affordable? Well, Katrina, you know what human beings are like, right? <laughs> so there'll be greed, there'll be uh, all kinds of traits, there'll be nationalism, politics, we've got to keep banging the drum the scientists the fda the cdc in america gavi sepi these are independent organizations by the way that are very effective backed by philanthropists largely it must be said but also governments the who are banging the drum to say one the vaccine must be free to the world two it must be available to those who need it most you know and, and that'll be the more vulnerable groups and also certain you know, ethnic minorities, vulnerable people in this vaccine business, by the way, people who have no sick pay. I mean, if ever there was a virus that shone a light on social inequality, it's this virus. And the reason why it spreads through California is mainly because those those people had to go to work. They were living, they were working in underpaid jobs. If they stayed home, they couldn't feed their children, you know. So if ever a, a, a pandemic revealed the horror of of, of, of social inequality, it's this virus. So we're all very aware of the fear of, you know a grab you know remember the european union's all over this is a massive alliance now of european union countries to, to make the vaccine available throughout europe whoever needs it most now maybe that's a bit happy clappy uh 
but certainly it is in uppermost in our minds is to make this vaccine available to everybody in the world who needs it. Um, now it's political. The Russians have got their own vaccine. The Chinese have rolled out three vaccines and, and allowed them to be used widely before a phase three trial. If they get there first, what's going to happen there? Will they stop other countries getting access to those vaccines? I don't know. The other thing to mention is um, the nine CEOs of the top drug companies have said they won't allow the vaccine process to be speeded up. There's a big fear here of rushing it through. Again, for political reasons, potentially. They've all said, we're not having that. You can forget that. You know, this, this has to go through the safety protocols that are essential for this. So everybody who's anyway, what's the word? Sensible might be the word or ethical or a human being is watching the very questions you've asked, Katrina, up close and personal and, and, and over our dead bodies kind of territory that this will be allowed to certain groups or certain countries or certain vested interests. That cannot happen would be the view. And let's hope that's the case. Thanks for that, Luke. That's that's partially reassuring. We hope that, that uh, you're right. I, I mean, part of the problem is that international institutions like the United Nations are much weaker than they have been in the past and that there's there's no one organization except i suppose the who which has issues of its own that we can all count on killian um as part of the whole virology um exploration story testing must have been something that can i don't know the answer to this which is why i'm asking you when did people start be start being able to test human beings for uh being infected by viruses is, is it a relatively new thing? Did we count on symptoms up to a certain point? I mean, in, in this case, we're looking at asymptomatic carriers of a virus who often shed the virus and, and transmit it before they show symptoms. What actually, when did testing begin, perhaps, tell us? If we look back at virology, I suppose traditionally it would have been a, a fairly slow process to diagnose infection. We first visualized viruses back in the 1930s um, after the development of the electron microscope. Um, and then afterwards, we would have, in essence, cultured viruses in, in cell lines or in, in animals. So if we look at when the first uh, influenza virus was retrieved from an infected individual, it was in the 1930s uh, in, in London. and that was where the virus was grown in a lab. Now, viruses can take a number of days to grow or some can, some more slow growing viruses take a couple of weeks. So from the point of view of turning around results very quickly, um, cell culture wasn't, uh, I suppose, particularly effective. Um, so an awful lot of diagnoses would have been clinical um, in years gone by or in decades gone by. And I suppose that was helped in part by the fact that a lot of certainly respiratory viruses people would recover before the need for a, a diagnosis was there. What probably revolutionized um, diagnostic virology in many respects um, was, was HIV really, um, which uh, Luke has alluded to earlier, um, in part because it was the first I suppose, virus that, that came around at the time when the polymerase chain reaction or molecular diagnostics had just uh, started to come to the fore. So in some respects, the way things happened in the 1980s, um, HIV sort of came into the human population at the right time. Um, had it come in sort of a, you know, a decade or, or 20 years earlier, I think it probably would have caused um, an awful lot more damage than it did. So. What happened with PCR in, in the middle of the 1980s was that it allowed us to amplify very small amounts of either DNA um, or in, for some viruses, RNA um, in the bloodstream of individuals. That was what happened for HIV. We were able to, to monitor the viral load because one of the things that happened with, with HIV was that people after they were initially infected were often very well and asymptomatic for about a decade. Um, and people thought it was a bit like the herpes simplex, the cold sore virus, that the virus was just latent and wasn't causing any damage. But actually it was um, a chap called David Ho in uh, the Aaron Diamond uh, HIV center in the States 
demonstrated that actually what was happening during that decade was that the virus was replicating um, at an incredible rate and, uh, and Luke will know this better than me, was basically consuming all of our, our CD4 cells, which are a key component of the immune system. So what happened during that apparent period of latency was that actually your immune system was being was being decimated and then people died of cancers or opportunistic infections that people with an intact immune system wouldn't necessarily suffer from. So what we're using today now is, so PCR has obviously changed since the 1980s, but in essence, the way we used it for HIV allowed us to apply the same thinking to the likes of hepatitis C or, or CMV or, or even influenza and other respiratory viruses. So PCR is, is really sensitive, it works really well. Um, uh, but again, as, as Luke has alluded to, it does require uh, a level of expertise, it requires a, a level of investment um, and typically some sort of specialist knowledge within a, a laboratory, uh, sort of a medical microbiology laboratory or virology laboratory like ourselves. And that can make it, I suppose, not terribly applicable or not terribly useful for, for some low and middle income countries. And also it can make it challenging when you want to try and bring testing into a, a sort of a non-laboratory setting. So either in the community or, or in the home. But I think in the broader sense for outside of virology and testing, I think what this pandemic I suppose has highlighted um, is how unprepared I suppose our health service in Ireland is for some event like this. Now granted, thankfully these events are, are quite rare, but we know that our hospital system reaches capacity every winter um, just with straightforward influenza. And influenza is not unpredictable. Um, we know when it's going to occur, give or take a, a few weeks every year, but yet our hospitals are over capacity typically by the time we reach the winter season. And we and that really is a, a situation that we shouldn't accept as a, as a, an, I suppose, sort of third, first world country at this point in time. We know that hospitals should be operating, generally speaking, at a capacity of about 75 to 80% so that you have that surge capacity when something goes wrong. Whereas in Ireland, we're typically um, operating at a capacity of about 100% or even over 100% um, in many of our hospitals. We also know that we had significant challenges in March and April around laboratory testing capacity for, for SARS-CoV-2. Now, to be fair, there was a, an element of a, a global supply chain issue um, associated with that. But also we know that we didn't have the the infrastructure on island within our hospital laboratories um, and within our own laboratory here at UCD to be able to test the number of uh, specimens that we wanted to be able to test on on a regular basis because obviously testing um, in and of itself isn't a isn't a magic bullet and it doesn't control the infection but it's a vital component of of the public health response because it allows us to interrupt chains of transmission and it allows us to isolate individuals and to inform the contact tracing process. So I think what we need to do from a, a diagnostic perspective now is in essence, bring it as, as near to the, the patient as, as possible and to make it as, as readily available as possible. But that does require a, an infrastructure that, that wasn't there previously. And I think it, it comes back to a, an earlier point that that Fintan made us was one of the things that has that has been most um, striking for me in the course of this pandemic has been the way our society has been um, revealed to be to be flawed in, in many respects. If we look at the institutions uh, affected, um, be they nursing homes or direct provision centres, um, or and actually the prisons have done remarkably well in the context of, of this whole situation. What we saw about direct provision centres and about nursing homes was that the staff in those uh, and the meat processing plants as well, of course, the staff in those settings often had to work in, in more than one location to get to a living wage to support their families. They weren't, they didn't have sick leave or sick pay rather as people have said. So in essence they were going into work while symptomatic and that, that's not to criticise them, they obviously had a an horrendous choice to make but but certainly speaking for, for myself before this pandemic I wasn't aware of the challenges faced by um, 
staff working in the healthcare setting and working working in our nursing homes. Obviously, the majority are based within the private sector, but the HSE, I think, has ownership of about 20%. Um, and perhaps that was willful um, ignorance on, on, on my part. Uh, similarly, I didn't realize the pressures that people in the food industry, we all see lower prices um, in our supermarkets on a, on a weekly and a monthly basis. And we probably don't think about the process that food goes through to, to get there. We, we heard stories from the meat processing plants of, of people living together, sharing accommodation, sharing transport, often sharing beds on a shift type rota system um, purely because they couldn't afford anything else. And then sim the same individuals who are working in our meat processing plants or who are working in our nursing homes um, and residential care facilities were uh, themselves staying in direct provision centers crowded into bedrooms with members of with members of other families so they didn't even have um, a room to themselves or with their own family so physical distancing was was fairly impossible for them so I think the 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 medical side of, of this is obviously key and I think it needs this is like this is going to happen again you know we're we're at 2020 now. We've had three sort of cross-species transmission events from coronaviruses alone in the first 20 years from with SARS, the original SARS at the end of 2002. We had MERS in 2012 and now SARS-CoV-2 in 2019. And there are hundreds of coronaviruses in bats, um, because we, which we know because of surveillance that was carried out after the original SARS coronavirus in 2003. Thankfully, those first two viruses didn't really get very far and um, they didn't become readily transmissible between humans but SARS-CoV-2 has managed to do that um, and as I said it, it's likely to happen again it's not really a question of if it's more a question of when so I think what we need to try and learn and take from this is that we need our system to be better equipped in the future than it is now and I think that means we need to be in a position where we can accept the fact that 10, 20 percent of our beds will lie vacant in hospitals and that that's okay you will have empty wards because you have capacity and you're keeping that spare capacity there for whether it's a, a bad winter season or whether it's for a pandemic or, or a particular outbreak or just so you can rotate the wards to allow you know or to prevent the increasing um, incidence of antimicrobial resistance uh, in various drugs so there's a huge amount that we need to take from this diagnostics obviously is is a key part of it um but to be fair i'd say that the hsc and the, and the department have done have invested a huge amount in putting in place um the, the testing capacity um over the last six months but we've seen that the the numbers are probably just going to keep increasing and and in the absence of of a vaccine if this um, and if we want to keep our our children back in school and we want the universities to open um, and we want to uh, allow our society to return to some level of, of new normal, um, then testing is, is a key component of that. But also it's about um, having the infrastructure in place more broadly across our, our primary care settings. Obviously the community hubs that we had established for SARS-CoV-2, they never existed before in Ireland. Um, we, don't we weren't able to use GPs because of the risk of infection. We've obviously, redeployed a, a huge number of people from non-medical tasks to swabbing in the community to contact tracing um, and all of those people will go back to work and the system will be under pressure again so i think it's a question we need to ask ourselves as a as a society you know whether it's a, a one-tier system or a two-tier system I, I my personal views as aren't really relevant but i think we need to figure out and decide what what type of health service we want to be able to provide for people and one that will care for people from from the, the cradle to the grave and as I said I would take on board um, Finton's point earlier about the nursing homes it's very difficult to look back on that setting and, and feel that those individuals weren't failed in some way it certainly wasn't willful um, and there was an awful lot of virus in the community and it's difficult even now to look back to think how you could have insulated that group completely and um, just given the, the nature of the fact that staff needed to go in there from the community um, but certainly I think it's a it's a salutary tale for us all um, as we move into what's what's likely to be a, a challenging winter. Okay Killian that that was very eloquent and I, I think it's it's really interesting that two of the most influential scientists uh, 
in Ireland at the moment have both alluded to uh, structural inequality, to the way we run our society as, as something that, that played a very deleterious role during this pandemic. Killian, I have one more technical question to ask you, forgive me. Um, the whole testing thing has become a matter of public interest, obviously, and I know that everyone has been doing their best and the PCR test is what is used. There was a segment in the press recently about uh, a new, relatively new antigen test that's being piloted in County Roscommon, um, in schools, in the agricultural area, where there are congregations, uh, which is much more rapid than PCR. It may not have the same sensitivity, but it may have a reasonably good um, effectiveness. Where, where it, and the HSE is, is a partner in this pilot scheme, so I presume it might be something that you're aware of and know about. Could you tell us what you think about that as a possibility for the future? Yeah, of course. I think it's it's really important for people to appreciate that we're we're very open to trying new tests and new assay platforms as they become available and as they come to market. I think we have to be cautious about um, moving into new areas just because uh, it seems to be, I suppose, the the fashionable thing to do in some respects. We don't, at this point in time, really use antigen testing for anything else. That's pri primarily because PCR is so good, primarily because antigen is less sensitive, and obviously we haven't been in this situation before. So I think antigen is certainly something that we can look at. The problem at the moment is really getting good real world data um, that we can choose to evaluate um, the various tests. Because if we look typically, obviously, for the likes of the, the PCR assays that are out there and the, the large assay manufacturers have, uh, you know, have published data on the performance of those assays that we can evaluate and, and compare with each other. If you, if you look at antigen tests, there's a huge amount of focus and interest on them um, in, in, the, in the lay media, but there's not a huge amount of um, high quality evidence available. And that's, that's to be under, understood. It's, that's, that's not a, necessarily a criticism. Um, obviously, it takes time to generate real, real world data that uh, companies can share. Um, but it is a challenge when you're trying to d decide what to roll out within within a community and within a testing um, strategy. So certainly we have plans within the HSE. I'm not familiar with the test that is being used in in Roscommon, um, but I know there are plans within the HSE to work with a couple of existing suppliers to evaluate antigen tests as they come to the market. Um, and from a, an NVRL perspective, antigen testing would tend to be more near patient. So um, if we if we can support that work, we will, but probably from an evaluation perspective, it would make more sense to do that on, on site, whether it's in a, a, say, a hospital lab or whether it's in one of the community sampling hubs. But I think I think antigen will have a, a role to play. Um, as, as you said, it's it's less sensitive. The, the general principle with antigen testing is that you can overcome that lack of sensitivity either with your frequency of testing or by the number of tests that you perform. So for example, if you have 20 people in a classroom or 20 people in a workplace and you're concerned about a SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, if you test all of those individuals with um, antigen tests, you're very, very, very unlikely to get 20 false negatives, if you like. So you can overcome that sensitivity because you're testing a large group um, without having to take samples and send them to the uh, to a laboratory for PCR-based testing. But at the moment, it is really a question of just, I think we do need to ensure that the quality of the testing that we introduce remains high, um, regardless of, of the platform. And as I said, we were also, people will be familiar with the fact that we're doing work in, on saliva testing as well. Again, there might be a little fall off in sensitivity, but from the point of view of um, it being a less invasive sample, an easier sample to take certainly from say uh, children and, and young adults um, and it might be more preferable let's say in a serial testing capacity where where people are having repeat testing done over a number of weeks or months and um, again i think saliva may well have a role to play but it is it's a departure from what we normally do and i think it's just important that from a laboratory perspective that we that we maintain our standards um, and ensure that we don't um, just introduce uh, 
the new thing, the, you know, the new methodology, just because it's it's a uh, it's shiny and there's a lot of focus on it. I think we just have to make sure that everything goes through a a robust evaluation and, and validation procedure, as we would do with any any other test. Obviously, I appreciate that there's a this is a there's a time pressure on this, so we want to get it done quickly. But as I said, for me, the, the most important thing is getting it done in a in a safe and, and effective manner. It's obviously it's not a treatment, it's not a it's not a vaccine, but it's still important that we generate accurate results in 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 insofar as we can. Okay, thanks, thanks, Killian. It would be great if that could move forward quickly and give us the opportunity for much more rapid testing than we have at the moment, and also not have people having to isolate. Uh, for long periods when they don't have to, particularly in an environment where there isn't sick pay for a large number of our workers. Fintan, you're going to get the last word, lots of words if you want. Um, you've heard two of our most eminent scientists take up what you said about structural inequality, about the fact that there are flaws in society that were here long before the pandemic arrived, that that exposed even further. Are you hopeful that we will learn something from all of this? Uh, and change some of the things like our health service after it's over? Uh, or are we perhaps doing that now? Well, I, I am hopeful, but I, I, I would sort of stress that we're, we're on a knife edge with, with all of these things. I think the politics of all of this and how it plays out um, is going to be crucial. I think there are four things, and I'll very briefly uh, just touch on them really, uh, that have been brought to the fore around this. And in all of them, these are, they're not abstract issues, right? They're, 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 um, uh, they're very much entangled with the very deliberate uh, political movements which have sought to destroy things and which have been in the ascendant, right? <laughs> so the first of these is the assault on science and on expertise. You know, we, we've, we've had the pleasure of, of listening, you know, to Luke and to Killian, and, and uh, if there's one good thing that's come out of this horrible um, experience, it's it's that, um, you know, we've had rock star scientists. We've had, we've, we've, we've got um, a public awareness of the, the, the brilliance of, of this, so much of this work, uh, of its importance, but also of its, of its public spiritedness, you know, of the fact that the vast majority of scientists, particularly those who work in independent institutions like universities, public health institutes, um, are, are, are in it for the public good. And that this is one of the, um, one of the saving graces of our societies, right? If we, if we did not have these people, the trouble we'd be in would be, would be vastly greater. However, we can't say this without recognizing that there has been a very, very deliberate, consistent and well-funded attempt to delegitimize science and more broadly to delegitimize the whole idea that some things are true and other things are not true. You know? so, so, so science is, is by no means in, an infallible uh, nexus. It's, you know, every scientist will tell you that they operate themselves through trial and error. Error is part of it. But it is evidence-based. It's based on the idea that we, 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 we honestly try to discover what the evidence is and act on it. And of course, that's also what journalism is about. It's what honest political debate is about. But we've had this very, very consistent, highly driven attempt to undermine all of that. Uh, and one of the things that this, is, this experience has told us is we have to fight back against that. We have to re- we have to fight for science, but we also have to fight for the idea of, 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 of evidence-based um, understanding of the world around us. Uh, and uh, we have to do that with urgency and, 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 and with passion. The, secondly, this is related very strongly to w w why have we had this huge assault on, on, on evidence? Why do we have, you know, on both sides of us, you know, in, in Britain and in the United States, regimes which, which um, frankly, lie and take pleasure in lying and think it's fine and fun. Why do we have Michael Gove saying we've had enough of experts? You know, why do we have Trump, uh, uh, you know, denuding so much of, of, of American science? Why, why, were the, why, why were the pandemic units in, 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 in American government taken away? You know, that they were there, they've been established by Obama, taken away. This is active. 
and the fundamental reason for it, of course, is, is linked into the environmental question. It's linked to climate change denial. Um, climate science threatens big interests, very, very wealthy, powerful interests. The carbon-based economy you know, is fighting back through delegitimizing, defunding uh, science and also truth, right? So they get across the idea that there's no really any such thing. It's all just opinion. It doesn't really matter. Um, and the pandemic comes along and says, well, actually, I'm real, um, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I don't care whether you think I'm, I'm true or not. I'm, you know, I can, I can kill you. Um, but, but there is a strong connection here, I think, between climate change denialism and, and, and the assault on science. Um, again, I'm, I'm hopeful that one of the things that may come, come out of this is um, that the pandemic has reminded us, and, you know, we were talking earlier about amnesia, but it's reminded us of our fragility as a species and of our of our, our our place on the planet you know the planet doesn't particularly care whether we live or die <laughs> it's it's up to us and our complacency about climate change i think is 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 linked to our, our broader complacency which is fed into um our lack of preparedness in terms of the pandemic so i'm i'm, I'm hopeful that a renewed awareness of danger will also feed into a, 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 a renewed sense of how much we depend on evidence and how much we depend on science. The, the third thing which I think has to change, you know, is, is, is the public view of healthcare. I mean, if, if you look over the last 20 years as part of this uh, complacency about, about public health, you know, we've had this huge shift from a discourse of, of, of health as a, as, as a public good to health as a private good and as a, as, as a commodity that you can buy. Um, you know, e even in the middle of the pandemic, there's huge excitement about the fact that you can go out and spend whatever vast amount of money on the new Apple Watch, which will measure your blood oxygen levels, you know, as if that's the most important, that's what health is. Health is you monitoring obsessively your own health. Uh, and I'm not saying for a minute that, of course, there are you know individual responsibilities about health, about what we eat, about taking exercise, all that stuff. I'm, I'm not you know for a minute dismissing any of that. But it's been at the expense of a consciousness that that health is primarily a public good, and that none of us can be healthy if we're not all healthy. You know that if if we if we allow contagion, if we allow infection, and then if we allow the social conditions that breed those things to continue, then ultimately we all suffer. We all suffer in terms of our health, we suffer in terms of the economy, we, we, we suffer in terms of society. So I'm hoping that this has given us the kick that we need to say, and, and Kelly already mentioned this, we, we cannot afford to have lack of universal care. You know? um, and by universal healthcare, I don't just mean hospitals. I think we, we've had an obsession with hospitals. Um, nursing homes are part of the healthcare system. You know, the health and social care, we, we need an integrated system. And what we've been doing is moving in the opposite direction, moving towards di disintegrating the system, towards, you know, having different levels of, of, of patients according with, with, with how they're paying, uh, with having a mix of public and private in, 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 in social care. Um, we need to integrate our healthcare systems and we need to integrate it on the basis of rights, you know, on the basis that everybody has an entitlement to, um, adequate healthcare when they need it, you know, and, and, and that that's not determined by money. We've theoretically been moving towards a lot of this with the Sloan Care program, but the pace of that change has been um, far, far too slow. I, I hope that this just forces us to say, we have to start doing the things we've been talking about at a community level, for example. Um, we, we know that if we, if we, everybody knows that we need, you know, proper community healthcare, the first, port of call should not be an incredibly expensive high-tech hospital. It should be the local healthcare center that you can you can walk down to or, or, or get to pretty fast. Um, and and we just haven't we just haven't been building those at, at the kind of rate um, that anybody thinks necessary. I think on current levels we, we, we will have fulfilled this launch of care the first step, which is the building of the community healthcare uh, by by 2050, you know, <laughs> it has to be by 2025. It, you know, th th there has to be a real concentrated public effort to build these systems and to fund them properly. And we have to talk about lots of other stuff in, in relation to taxation and all the rest of it that's going to follow this. And, and the final thing is big government. So we've also had, of course, 
really going back to 1979, 1980, the whole neoliberal revolution of undermining the idea of big government, so undermining the idea that government is, 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 is necessary. Um, Ronald Reagan's brilliantly effective, you know, folksy thing about, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the most alarming words in the English language are, I'm, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, actually, you know, the pandemic reminds us that those are not alarming words. Those are words we need to hear. You know, we need government and, and it, 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 government in the broadest sense. I'm, I'm not saying this is everything is done by a cabinet of ministers, but, but, but government in the broad sense of the public realm, which belongs to all of us, which is democratically controlled, uh, which treats us all as equal, dignified citizens, is, is absolutely critical to, to our health. And we can't even just think about gov governments nationally. You know, pandemics are not national emergencies. The, the countries which have tried to, to, to apply exceptionalism to the pandemics are the ones who have failed. And we, we see a terrible example of this just, just across the Irish Sea. Uh, the exceptionalism, the world beating, you know, red, white and blue, British solutions to all of the stuff, you know, whether it's from the apps to the testing regimes um, has actually been disastrous. The thing that we've learned about this is that we actually need to get back to global governance. You mentioned the, 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 the assaults on the United Nations, the weakening of global governance, Brexit, all of these kind of things have been, and this is again, is very, very deliberate. This isn't stuff that's just happened in the abstract. So um, we, we need to politicize in the good sense, um, the, the, the lessons that, are, that, are, that are, are, are staring us in the face um, out of what has happened. And I'm pretty optimistic that we will. We know that humans as a species don't make the right changes when we should, we make them when we have to. And I think um, the pandemic has put us into a situation where um, really our lives do depend um, on, um, on, on changing our public attitudes to those four things. Wow, that was, that was a terrific summing up of where we need to go. It's been fascinating to listen to the four of you. We're not going to have time for a, a broader discussion where you can all ask each other questions, which I'm sure you would love to. But it, it occurs to me that um, we think of the virus, people say the virus doesn't care, the virus doesn't mind about borders, the virus is uh, vicious, etc. The virus has no choice. The virus can only think about moving to the next person to continue its existence. We, on the other hand, do have choices. And we have choices about how we run our society, how we run our response to this particular pandemic uh, and whether we want to change for the better when all of this is over, preferably during while it's going on. So we have some kind of nimbleness about how we approach all of this in the future. Um, you've all been wonderful. Luke, thank you for our Quizzes Talk tour through infection, through the battleground states of, of uh, viral um, pursuit of us all. Killian, thank you so much for your eloquent description of society actually which i wasn't expecting to get from you um and for telling us about the history of virology and how all of that comes about and you know all my sympathies to you by the way in in the position you're in having to manage this in in a place i mean in a country where you realize that everything is not as good as it should be that is disheartening and i wish you the very best in, in the future with it ida thank you so much for being our great national expert on the the spanish flu uh, that book is is a really wonderful piece of writing. It's got all the evidence anyone might need uh, about what happened 100 years ago. And I suppose it's sort of sobering to reflect that we didn't learn all that much from it. We do have short memories, uh, and that's very sad. And Finton, thank you so much, as always, for giving us some semblance of hope, I guess, that change is at least possible, even if we don't seem to want it right now that it is possible, it's possible to look to a society that might be better and treat its citizens uh, in a more dignified and respectful way. Thank you all. Um, see you all again, I hope, at some stage in the future. Good night. <laughs>